Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the first day of October in the year of our Lord, 2024. I've noticed in the past there's certain videos that get an awful lot of responses. A recent one was the one on Stephen Lawson. Um, all I can say about that is there are certain things in there. We should not assume that a person is a born-again Christian simply because they're religious or a famous teacher or a famous preacher or whatever. Many of them are lost. Many of them have never been born again. See, Nicodemus. There's no indication in the Bible at all that Nicodemus was a, what we would call a wicked man. He believed in God. He was a famous rabbi. He was a member of the Sanhedrin the ruling body in Israel, under Caesar, of course. And he's the one that came to Jesus by night, saying, you know, we know that these things you're doing come from God. Nobody can do what you're doing unless God has sent him. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born again. We have that whole conversation in John chapter 3. Nicodemus was not, in fact, Nicodemus couldn't be born again until after the crucifixion, death, resurrection, and Pentecost. Because the new covenant only came into effect that, uh, then. You have to have the new covenant to be born again. The Holy Spirit cannot dwell in you until your sins are fully atoned for. And that was not possible until... Christ's death on that cross and the resurrection proves that he accomplished that mission. His primary mission was to atone for the sins of the entire world that God could again dwell in humanity, which is his original plan, that we might be his image, his dwelling place in creation. And that is his what he's working out now, restoring his original purpose in creating humanity. But I was thinking today and thinking about the corruption of so much that's going on, that we're, we're coming to the end of the age. There's no doubt about it anymore. They're not only uh, spiritual, but natural. The, there's natural limits. And we're already bumping into those. The, the, of course, there's fools out there that say there is no natural limits. Really. Like I said, there's fools out there that say that. <sighs> there's people out there that believe the Earth is flat, too. Even though you can measure the curvature of the Earth, anybody can do it if they want to. Plus, you can get on the Internet and contact somebody at the other side of the world today and say... Hey, could you tell me where the sun in the sky is, where you are? Oh, it's dark where you are? It's light here? How does that work? <laughs> if the Earth is flat. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think it works. Nevertheless, there's people that believe that. There's probably people that believe the earth is square because in the scripture, the prophets talk about the four corners of the earth. But what's the four corners? North, south, east, and west. Doesn't mean the earth is square. It talks about the circle of the earth, too. There's all kinds of stuff. You know, people, ignorant people who are dedicated to ignorance, think that's faith. Believing the absurd. And there are things in the Bible that seem absurd to the world. To the wise. To the religious. Like a crucified Messiah dying for the sins of the world. It's foolishness to them. Foolishness to the world. But it's the wisdom of God. It's the wisdom of God. All right. So, anyway, I was, I was thinking this, this morning. I couldn't sleep. Um... And my mind went back to the, the little church that we went to for about a year, not as members, but that was not possible. They were Nazarenes. I, 
I've had a, a friendship with a, a old Nazarene pastor and his wife uh, years ago when I was pastoring the church around here. First uh, time I was a, a solo pastor anywhere. And I'm not trained in that anyway, thank God. Uh, I wasn't brainwashed by some Bible college or seminary. I, I couldn't I couldn't fit into that anyway. I'm too independent. I, I'd say, really? I'd challenge them, and typically places like that don't like that. They, they assert their authority. I said, nope. Yeah, uh, university was a difficult place for me to be. And I was difficult for the instructors, too, the professors. I wouldn't take the BS from them, either. But they'd throw out some nonsense that was based on, on garbage, and I'd challenge them on it. I was so bad. You probably don't remember, but uh, Ronald Reagan bombed Libya, tried to kill Gaddafi with a bomb strike. And the next day at university, I showed up with my Arab headdress on that I'd got in Israel back in 85. <laughs> People were looking at me. In fact, my mother was taking classes halfway across the, you know, she was, she was uh, over uh, about 100 yards away. And I heard her say, it's amazing how sometimes your senses are amplified. I, she was talking to somebody and said, I don't know that guy. <laughs> Uh, all right, so that's a side issue. Why did that come to mind? I don't know. Anyway, I was thinking about this this little Nazarene church, and this is not just about Nazarenes, but I, I did, I have, I still get responses on that video years later, a couple years later at least, about my experiences there and why I left it and realizing the, the um, I mean, I have no antipathy toward Nazarenes at all. I have concern. I have Christian love. I mean, but the the deception, the the self deception of John Wesley, and the Nazarenes just grabbed, especially on the, the, those particular doctrines, the holiness doctrines of Nez, of Wesley, uh, are toxic. And I didn't realize how toxic they were until I'd spent enough time there. And this was sort of they were trying to be traditional, trying to hold on to. Not the old Nazarene stuff. I mean, they, they didn't wear the... Uh, you kept women wearing pants, which used to be a no-no. Uh, Nazarenes had liberalized a lot by then. But uh, uh, there were still Nazarenes. And the, the, the denomination has gone Rick Warren, seeker-sensitive, uh, youth culture, anything goes. Paint the inside of the church black. Make it look like a, a nightclub. Literally, in this area, big Nazarene churches. It seemed to be pushed by the, the denomination because they were all doing it, even small churches, trying to imitate this stuff, put the, put the big video screens in, the latest so-called Christian music, you know, the, 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 whatever was out in the last 30 days. That's they call worship. It's not worship at all. I don't know what worship is. But I think that the straw that broke the camel's back and what led me to come back there and rebuke him, because he wouldn't, I wrote to him and he didn't answer my letter. And so I went there and I actually confronted him before church, uh, waiting for him to come in. And it extended into the service time a bit, I suspect, before I left, was that he had said, in one of his messages, talking about going to heaven, and he said, I hope I'm good enough to get there. So this applies not just to Nazarenes, not just to this man, but to the majority of people that call themselves Christians. The vast majority of Roman Catholics, <clears throat> the vast majority of the Orthodox, the vast majority, the Methodists, certainly the majority of Nazarenes, although they they let you believe in something else. I asked his son, and he and I said, 
what about Christ's imputed righteousness? And I'd explain what that was because it's not part of their vocabulary. In other words, Christ's gift of righteousness, where we're given his righteousness. And of course, forgiveness, forgiveness of all our sins is a finished work. And he said, well, you're, you're, some of us, he said, he sort of believed that. that was, I said, what about your dad? And he said, well, I can't talk for him. But the, the idea that I hope I'm good enough to get there. I mean, family members, I, I mean, uh, I married into a Roman Catholic family. And my father-in-law, it was, I'd say they're per, they were pretty devout Catholics. Their children weren't, but <sighs> and I, I remember him when he was he was in a assisted living situation and and he was saying his wife had passed away by this time and he was saying that well his his hope was to get to purgatory and I remember we took him out to dinner. I think he get him. Some, he loves spaghetti, and I was saying, "Burn, you don't have to go to purgatory. Christ died for your sins, but his faith was in the church and the sacraments. He didn't know Christ. He knew about Christ. He had a." indirect faith in Christ. He trusted that Christ gave his grace to the church to distribute through the seven sacraments. That's Catholic doctrine. Well, it, before Francis. There is no Catholic doctrine anymore. <laughs> well, it's Catholic as in universal. Everything goes. That's Catholic now. Everything goes. All religions lead to God. It's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, he alone. No religion leads to God. Only Christ. Christ himself is the way, the truth, and the life. In Christ himself is forgiveness. In Christ himself is salvation. If you're not in Christ, you're not saved. It has nothing to do with a man-made religious system, which is what Rome is, what orthodoxy is, what the Nazarenes are what the Baptists are, or tend to be. Did you know Kamala Harris is a Baptist? Who could tell, right? What does that mean? She, she sort of fit in with the Southern Baptists because that's what I found there. Tradition, man-made religion, man-made program. Like Billy Graham and his crusades. Manipulation. Psychology. Getting people to make a decision. That's not what Christ calls us to. He doesn't come up, out and say, take up your cross and follow him. No, he doesn't say that. They have to try to make salvation easier than it is. It's free. But we, we draw back. First of all, we draw back from the conviction of our sins by the Holy Spirit. Not some preacher preaching at us, making us feel guilty. No, when the Holy Spirit shows you what you truly are. holds a mirror up to your face and said, look at yourself. This is what you are. This is, there's Christ. That's what you're supposed to be. Convictions of sin, of righteousness, of Christ. Christ was, is not present physically, but convictions of the standard of what we're supposed to be, the image of God, which Christ is and of judgment. And, I mean, I, I told the Nazarene pe uh, preacher, get a hold of me, we'll talk. No. See, it would, 
it would be too dangerous. Because if he accepted the, the gospel, as it truly is, he'd have to repent of what he's been preaching for years. Self-righteousness. Which is what holiness movement is. What Wesley said, we stand on occasion, Wesley's inconsistent, we, uh, that, that we stand before the judgment seat of Christ in our own righteousness. Charles Finney, who was not a Nazarene or part of that movement, not a Wesleyan, he was a Presbyterian, said we stand in our own righteousness before the judgment seat of Christ. Well, if you stand, but the scripture says all our righteousness is as filthy rags. What does the scripture say? That we are given a righteousness. This is where Calvinism is correct. Not because Calvin says it. He doesn't say this clearly, by the way. But because the scriptures say it. That, that, that we are not only forgiven, but we're given a righteousness, a wedding garment. Christ's parables those invited to the wedding feast. A garment is supplied to us. A spotless garment is supplied to us that is Christ's own righteousness. It is what theologians call an alien righteousness. In other words, it's not intrinsic to us. It comes from outside of us. It is given to us as a gift, a covering, that makes us clean, the blood of Christ, makes us acceptable to God. Because we're in Christ, and Christ perfectly kept the law. We didn't. We're given the righteousness of Christ. So it's not about what we did or do, but what he did. It's a free gift. You don't earn it. You cannot earn it. Because we're sinful. We're still sinful. Even after we're born again, still sin still dwells in our mortal body. We still sin. As John says, if anyone says he has no sin, he deceives himself, and the truth is not in him. Nazarenes don't quote that verse. Because they believe in sinless perfectionism as a second work of grace. John Wesley. Of course, that requires redefining sin to something other than the two great commandments. Because who can say that they keep those perfectly? Unless you're utterly self-deceived. I fear for Nazareth. Because if we're not trusting in Christ, but we're trusting in our own righteousness, in addition to Christ, like Catholics. Oh, yeah, we, we need the grace of God. We trust in Christ. We trust in what Christ did on the cross. But we also must have good works. So Christ subsidizes our salvation, but does not purchase it in whole. So it's not a free gift. It's just assisted salvation. That is not what the scripture teaches. The scripture teaches if you trust in Christ plus, you've cut yourself off from Christ because God will not allow people to glorify in their, themselves and their works. By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. That's why Wesley deluded the law to meaninglessness. Something that sinful man could do. The equivalent of Catholic mortal sin. It has so many loopholes in it. 
that nobody can commit mortal sin, practically. Because it has to be of your uninfluenced free will, which doesn't exist in human beings. We don't have that kind of free libertarian freedom does not exist in human beings. We are slaves of sin. That's part of the problem. We have to be set free. Whom the Son sets free shall be free indeed. But Nazarenes, the example of people in bondage, especially old school, women can't wear a, a wedding ring because uh, it's gold. And that, uh, it's, it's gold adornments are forbidden. No. Paul said, do not. You know, he talked about be adorned in your, for women to be adorned inside, not with expensive hairdos and, and outer appearance. A, a, a band on your finger, gold doesn't corrode, okay? It's the most practical metal to use for that. A band that indicates that you're in a covenant relationship with a husband and God is not a sinful thing. Other cultures use other things. That is not what the apostle meant when he talked about gold and hairdos and other stuff, fancy garments. He could say that same thing about men. Do not be adorned with a Rolex watch or a fine suit. Let your adornment be inside rather than in superficial appearance like the Pharisees. And so what do they do? Amish do the same thing, by the way. And Amish aren't Nazarenes. They focus on the externals and ignore the real issue, which is our hearts. And faith in Christ, this, this idea that, that our, our righteousness is anything other than filthy rags. It's contaminated because of flesh in us. Even when we're doing what we know is right in the sight of God, the flesh always has a wrong motive to do it. And our spirit, spirit does not, the new spirit does not sin. But the flesh does. The flesh will look at, how can I use that for myself? How can I glory in this? The flesh is always about self. But the Nazarenes are not unique at all. They are representative, in a strange way, of the vast majority of what's called Christianity. Where you're taught... That yes, you must trust in Christ, but you also must do good works to earn that, that faith, that grace, to be worthy of the grace of God. But the scripture says Christ came in the world to save sinners, to save the wicked, not to save the righteous. It's a self-deception that I fear is fatal. I have no hatred except for these religious systems that deceive people and lead them away from the truth of Christ, from trust in what Christ did for us on the cross. The salvation God has prepared for us and for the entire world. The door's open for everyone. Christ paid for the sins of the whole world. Judgment is not based on what you've done, but who you trust. Are you in Christ or not? Have you come to Christ to be saved or not? Saved from your sin, from yourself. It's your relationship with Christ that determines whether or not your home is in heaven or not.
course, heaven is where Christ is. He's not staying up there. At the end of the millennium, God makes his home, permanent home, earth. Not heaven. The new earth. And what's God's temple? His people. Even today, God's temple is his people. If they build a new temple on the Temple Mount, tear down the, the Muslim mosque and the uh, monument over the, the rock there, it'll be an abomination. It'll be an abomination. It's not God's house. It'll be an absolute denial of the gospel. God removed the temple because it was completely obsolete and people were worshiping. The, 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 the true had come. The true temple, the true salvation had come. The true sacrifice had come. The old was obsolete and God allowed it for 40 years and then he had it swept away because it had become an abomination. Because God's salvation is in Christ alone. You cannot be saved by keeping the law or the Talmud or the Quran or anything else. You cannot be saved by keeping the Ten Commandments because you've sinned. What will you do with your sin? Christ is the solution. To reject Christ is the fatal sin. To say Christ is not sufficient is a terrible blasphemy against God. To say I must add something to what Christ has done is to slap Christ in the face and trample his blood underfoot. Do you understand that? Christians, do you understand that? Catholics, Nazarenes, Methodists, Baptists, Presbyterians, Anglicans, yada, yada, yada. Do you understand that? Christ alone himself is salvation. Are you in him? Do you belong to him? Is all your trust and confidence in him and what he accomplished on the cross your faith and confidence? Or do you think that's insufficient and you need to add something to that like your own works? You understand the problem. Repent and turn to Christ alone. Do you know him? Is he in you? If you're trusting in yourself, he's not. He's not. As Paul said, you've cut yourself off from Christ. For adding one commandment, circumcision. Could have been something else. In that case, it was circumcision. There were Jewish Christians teaching Christ is our sacrifice. He's the new sacrifice. Trust in Christ, but you must be circumcised too. The church, of course, rejected that. There was a big council meeting about that. And that idea was rejected. The Gentiles don't have to keep the law of Moses. Don't burden them with it. As I said, as Peter said, we haven't been able to keep it. Why are you going to put that burden on them? It's Christ where salvation is found. Not in commandments, not in laws, not in principles, not in the rules of men, not in traditions, not in institutions. It's only in Jesus Christ, and it's received as a free gift. Eternal life is a free gift that we receive through faith alone 
in Christ alone.